Welcome to Identity Church Sunday Morning Message, where sonship is revealed. Stay tuned at the end of this message to receive more information about resources available through Identity Church. Now grab your Bible, sit back, and enjoy a message from Identity Church that is already in progress. How many of you have enjoyed the Identity Series we've been doing? Don't lie to me, some of you have been complaining about it. Starting with my wife. I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to blend the PowerPoint with humor and illustrations, but I am doing PowerPoint for a reason. I'm doing it because I need this to be deep, deep, deep into your spirit. I believe that the body of Christ is lacking in its true understanding of who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. I've been hammering this for weeks now. I think we're on week six right now. Living in the power of the new creation. This is part two. And we're going to do a little quick uh, review as we go through here. And we're going to tell some new stories. I'm going to start off with a quiz to see where you're at. I want you to rate yourself one to ten in comparison to Jesus. I want you to compare yourself to Jesus. So how much anointing do you have compared to Jesus? Don't use negative. How much authority over sickness do you have versus Jesus? Are y'all doing the math? How much authority over the devil do you have when you compare yourself to Jesus? How much access to the Father do you have compared to Jesus? How much power for miracles do you have in comparison to Jesus? Would you compare yourself to Jesus? How much joy is in you? How much peace do you have? How much ability to love? Oh, and we know Jesus is a 10, but some of you, you know, you're like a 3. Susie was a two yesterday. You know, she, I was one in trouble, man. This morning we're getting dressed and we're in the bathroom and she says to me, she goes, you know, you're starting to look old. And man, that zing just came up here and I went, yes, but you're being more beautiful. I'm like, I am not picking a fight with her today. <laughs> Of course, this is a quiz, and it's a trick trick question. Do you realize that? Okay? Because you have Jesus himself living inside of you. The big mistake many Christians make is that they think that they are supposed to imitate Jesus. Catch this. We're trying to imitate him, and that's the problem. You have the same power as Jesus has, the same authority over sickness, the same ability to love as he does, and the same victory over sin that he had. Does that change your position? How does Christ actually become manifest in our lives? How does he live through us? How do you say shazam and access what is truly yours? I need a rub a genie. Last week, we started looking at three words. We'll open up the whole world of the living Christian life. No was the first word we look at. You were united with Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death? Why did Paul say this? Because they weren't living like they knew it. I've been walking with Jesus enough to know I can quote you some scriptures, but the question is, can I live it? I never live what I don't know. When I I was having a discussion this week about being a spiritual orphan, and I'm like, you know, the reality is I had become a spiritual orphan because my father was orphaned at 11 and had religious performance on him, and you reproduce who you actually are. And I had a father, so I wasn't an orphan. But how did I become a spiritual orphan? Why? Because he reproduced that fear-based 
performance in me because that's what was in him. Some of you don't like what you're having manifest around your life. You never need to find out who you are and why is it manifesting. That was good. Thank you, Karen, for saying amen. You have to know by revelation of the Spirit that some things has happened to you. You were united, you were united with Christ. That's the putting in Christ. It is like he is the vine and we are the branches. So now we are drawing his life and we are, beating, we, we are bearing his fruit. We are united with Christ. It comes back to this one thing. The history of Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection and his ascension. The Bible said he did it as us and he did it for us. His history is now my history. Was he involved before time began? Then you don't have a time problem. Get above the timeline and find out what he's trying to tell you. I used to say, I think God's watch is broke, and he corrected me one day. I'm above time. I don't have a watch. And I get frustrated, and he tells me to be patient. I'm looking at my watch. He goes, well, you look at a watch. I don't have one. No is the first word we looked at last week. This week, we're going to look at two other words in Romans 6. Consider, or in some of the old translations, it says to reckon. <clears throat> no is the first word that Paul used to describe the actual putting into practice our new life. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I, 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 did it, I did it on a, a couple of conversations with people. This week, somebody came to me. She said, well, you know, not everybody had Jesus walk to the wall like you did. I said, well, if you were as desperate as I was and willing to die, maybe he would. And I said to this person, you need an encounter that makes you know who God is. Until you have that encounter, you won't surrender. Present yourself. It goes back to the one thing, the history of Jesus Christ and his death and his resurrection and his ascension. The Bible said he did it as us, and he did it for us. His history is now our history. In the same way as Christ has died to sin, so you also have died to sin. Because Christ died for you and as you, because of this mystical union just as Jesus was resurrected from the dead, you now in this moment, in your true self, say true self, the real you, live by his resurrection life. How else can you say, I'm seated in heavenly places, if you haven't experienced the resurrection? Some of you are waiting to go to heaven to be Christ-like. And that's ridiculous. You're already Christ-like if you have Jesus in you, and you're already seated in heavenly places, and you can see above the, 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 the horizon. This is your true life. This is who you truly are. And it says that we know this. Until we know it, you're not going to do it. Knowing is the key here. Everything that Jesus achieves is now ours as much as it is his. Jesus got what we deserved so we could get what he deserved. Come on now. The very life of Christ has been infused into your life. We can never again define our life apart from Christ. Paul summed it up like this. For me to live is Christ. And my clicker just broke. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. Your mind is a valve. This is why you must renew your mind and find out who you are and where you're pulling your source from. What you let in, what lies you let in, will determine whether you believe this word. Whether you believe that, that, that he died, resurrected, and has given you everything. That's why you have to renew your mind. When you're renewing your mind, you know what you're doing? You're finding the lies that you've been believing. You're not good enough. You're not tall enough. You're not pretty enough. You're looking old. What lie have you been believing? I can't do that. I can't prophesy. Really? My sheep hear my voice and they follow none other. Why aren't you listening to the voice? That's prophecy. You've received the very life of Christ into you. Jesus lives inside of you without making you a puppet. Did you hear this? You are not his puppet. First, you have to know it. This week, I want to look at two other words in Romans 6. We'll start reading in verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that he also lived with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. You must consider yourselves. The word consider, <clears throat> in some of the older translation, it's the word reckoning. When you consider something, it does not cause anything to happen. When you consider you are taking an inventory or an assessment of a condition that already exists. Therefore, the state of being dead to sin and fully alive to God already exists as you are a Christian. He's saying, sit back and look at yourself, examine yourself. Consider. We must realize, we must seize this benefit by considering it to be so. Have you considered what the scriptures say about you? Have you taken an inventory of where you're at and why you don't line up and, 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 and see the things in scripture? When you consider, it means to regard oneself as... It means to consider and to keep it constantly before you. You know this is true, and now regard yourself in this light because it is reality. That is, if Jesus has died and risen from the dead as you and for you, the new birth means that the Holy Spirit has put you into that to make history because you have his history. It means to draw a logical conclusion when you consider something. All right? The moment you look at your feelings instead of looking at the truth of what Christ has done for you, you're in trouble. The Lord said this to me one day. Yes, son, you have true feelings. The problem is your feelings don't line up with truth. You can have true feelings. The problem is they don't line up with truth. Do I feel dead? Do I feel as if I am resurrected? <clears throat> it's like you're taking your spiritual pulse every other minute. Am I alive or am I dead? Am I experiencing resurrection peace? Do I feel strength from God? Do I feel the anointing? What, what constant turning inward is not considering? That is confusion. I, 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 I. 
I, 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 I. Your feelings will fluctuate, and all the fluctuations of feeling are basically lies. Feelings go up and down. You're dealing with chemistry when it comes to feeling and not facts. Con consider means that we begin to look at life from a new perspective. The word considering, consider, in the New Testament was a, an accounting term. It is a bookkeeper's terms in their language in the New Testament. That is where we get the word reckon comes from. When a bank account is reckoned, it is brought into alignment. This is a, the word consider is to reckon something. It originally deals with math and numbers. You know, any bookkeeper, and I do, I'm married to one, they are, <laughs> they're exact to the penny. And if they're one penny short, they'll stay up all night trying to figure out where that penny went. That is the word that is used here to consider, to reckon. You consider the facts. A bookkeeper cannot exaggerate the books. You go to jail. A, and certainly cannot be one penny under. You can't exaggerate it, and you can't subtract from it. You consider the exact truth for what Jesus has done for you, and not one penny under and not one penny over. When you consider, you're taking facts to make a decision. If this is true of Christ, then it must be the case with me. God has placed you in Christ, and when he says you are dead to sin, just as surely as Christ is dead to sin, and, true, and the true you are alive to God as Jesus is, no more and no less. Let me say it this way. If I will say that I'm dead to Christ and alive to him, and I keep saying it, and keep saying it, and keep saying it, and keep saying it, and keep saying it, eventually I'll become dead to Christ, uh, dead to sin. That's writing a bad check. Fake it until you make it. That's like writing a $1,000 check knowing you got 10 bucks in your bank account. Your day of reckoning's coming. Let's say you're totally broke and on the verge of filing bankruptcy. You lose your job. Everything's been shut off. Credit cards are maxed. You're in a hopeless situation. You are completely helpless to change your circumstances. <laughs> now, let's say the next day, someone that you knew about but were hostile towards. Check this out. Somebody that you knew about you're hostile toward them, wins a $500 million lottery. You knew that it had happened. You watched him buy the ticket. You watched him read the lottery numbers. And then you did something, then they did something unthinkable. They gave you the lottery ticket. You received the check. You saw all the zeros in your bank account. You didn't do anything to deserve it. As a matter of fact, you did things not to deserve it. You were hostile toward this person. All you could do is stand in wonder of this kind of love and say, thank you. Based on the reality of what has happened, you would begin to consider life differently. When the bill for your cell phone came, you wouldn't wonder how you're going to meet it. <laughs> Why? You consider somebody gave you a $500 million lottery ticket. Your worries would change. You would consider what happened. What would you do if you considered what happened? This guy that you were hostile to gives you a $500 million lottery ticket. Now I can pay my I consider this, and I become grateful. Is that not a picture of Christianity? 
You have those who feel, how am I going to pay this bill? Because it is all I have known my whole life, but something has drastically changed all of that. As you consider what has happened, you are now positioned to act differently. You are now positioned to access the full power of your bank account. If you live like it never happened, you could have all this. If, if you lived like it never happened, you could have all this limited wealth, but never tap into it. Because you either didn't know or didn't consider what you had. So what if you had a bank account with that kind of money? And you didn't consider that it was a gift and it was yours to spend. And you still walked around going, I don't know how I'm going to pay my cell bill. I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. I don't know how I'm going to buy me a new car. And you got all this money in the bank. That's what we do as Christians. This is what happens to every believer. We were completely helpless to get ourselves out of our condition, completely spiritually bankrupt, unable to keep the law to make ourselves right before God. The gospel is the call to rest, to receive the free, undeserving gift that God has given us in Christ. There is nothing man can do to earn salvation from his past or his present acceptance and walk with God. It is, from beginning to end, the grace of God, which can only be received by faith. The body of truth that proclaims the revelation of God is called the good news. Are you hearing this? News, by definition, is the announcement of something that has happened, not a list of things that must be done. The good news it's news. It's a fact. It happened. It's not a list of what you got to do. The heart of Christian life is to stand in wonder before his love and say thank you. The gospel is not a call to do something, but an announcement that all is done in the one who stood for all. The Christian life is not living on your own strength and resources but from the infinite Christ who lives within those who believe in him. And so we begin to consider life through the lens of Christ. Who is your life? You don't rely on feelings because they will lie. You face each day with the knowledge that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The scripture has come alive for me in the last couple of weeks all things. Life is now defined as Christ in me, the hope of glory. The third word, word, word we want to talk about is to present. Romans 6, 12 through 14, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not Present the members of your body to sin as instruments or weapons of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought to death to life, from death to life, and your members to God as instruments, weapons of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under the grace You can't understand after these weeks that we've been studying here that it is impossible to sin and reign or be a king. Do I need to say that again? It's impossible to sin or reign to be a king. You have dominion over your mortal body in your flesh. That would mean to live in bankruptcy despite a full bank account. The members of your bodies include your imagination, your emotions, which would give, which would, if I give a chance, have a mind of its own. 
This is where the possibility of sin is. There is no possibility of sin in the true me. Got to go back into week two, week three. We dealt with a lot of that. I am in Christ. But in the members of my flesh, the unredeemed part of me, my appetites, my desires, my thoughts, my imaginations, my speech, my emotions, these are all created by God and are good. Appetite for food is good. The desire for physical intimacy is good. The desire for companionship is good. My imagination is good. But sin would turn all of my appetites to seek meaning from themselves instead of from God. Who's your source? This is the habit's way of life that sin left behind, which must be retained, renewed, put off. Given the chance when, the, when, when a believer is depressed, they will turn to food. They will turn to alcohol, <laughs> turn to something other than God, and try to feed their own appetites. And we Christians do it all the time. And you're sitting at 500 pounds, belly aching about somebody who's a homosexual. Same scripture. Messed up appetites. That was my personal soapbox. Sin turns a natural, good, God-given appetite into lust, which just seeks to find its meaning of life outside of itself. So Paul says, stop allowing your flesh to reign as king in your body. Stop putting your body at the disposal of sin to be a weapon for Satan. No, put yourself in the disposal of God because you are dead to those old things. Present your body to God to be mighty weapons for righteousness in his hands. If sin gets a hold of my body, it becomes a weapon to destroy God's purpose. If I let Christ live in the members of my body, it becomes a weapon to bring about the purposes of God. That's real spiritual warfare right there. And so you present yourself, your body, your mind, your emotions to God moment by moment. Whenever a difficult situation comes up, and that is just a trigger for you to hear Christ in your heart say, I am. When you look into his face and all he is, and you say, you are, that is all I need to know. Thank you. You're more than enough. Let's get going. If there's 500 million in your bank account, you would act considering that fact completely different, and you would no longer act broke. We respond in faith based on what we know to be true. When you present yourself to God, you are opening the door to allow God in Christ to be all that he has promised. It is letting God be the God. Even when he says that I don't care what the situation is, I'm still God. You know that what Christ has done. You consider your life and this situation from that perspective. Now you present yourself to him, resting in him, and allowing him to be all he has revealed himself to be. You are not struggling to have enough faith to meet a problem or a situation. I was ministering to a friend yesterday, and I, and I said, I had this crazy preacher that gave me a life lesson that I've carried most of my Christian walk. I've battled fear. I've battled the emotions. And, and this preacher said to me, he goes, you need to change your position. He said, quit saying you are a man of fear trying to, trying to pull faith in. Flip this thing. You're a man of faith that's battling fear. You need to know your position. 
It, cha I, 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 it changed everything. I'm not a man of fear trying to get faith to come in. No, I'm a man of faith who battles a little bit of fear. And when you change your position, you change your perspective, everything changes. I was driving down the road. This is, this is now I'm just going to go ahead and get political here. Driving down the road this week. And, and, and you know, I, pray, I actually do pray. I pray for our city. I pray for our, our nation. I pray for our church. I pray for a lot of you. Just don't call you. <clears throat> But I, I had this vision of Eva Formosa. If you know Eva, Eva and I have been friends for a long, long time. She is a, a, a intercessor. She could be extremely prophetic. She has government on her life. And so I know her as that. And I'm driving down the road, and I see Eva Formosa in a vision, and she's got both her hands up, and she's holding up the edge of a building that is collapsing. And she is doing everything she can to keep this building from collapsing. And she's praying in tongues while she's doing it. But she's got her, she's got her hips locked and her, she's got her right arm up there. And she's doing this thing. And, and I'm, I'm looking at this vision and Jesus walks up to her. It looks like the corner of a house that she's holding up. And Jesus starts talking to her and she, she's, she's acknowledging Jesus and, and, and she could tell that he wants an embrace from her. The problem is she didn't know how to turn loose of her right arm because it's her strength arm. And she wanted to embrace Jesus, but she didn't know how to do that. Finally, she just made the choice, and she let go of her right hand, and she embraced Jesus, and her left arm became strong enough and pushed that thing right up into position. Until you learn to turn loose of your strength, he'll never become the strength you need. And as soon as she did that, the vision changed, and it went from the house to a map of the United States of America. And as I've, as I've processed this, I realized as the body of Christ starts interceding for our nation, we better quit doing it in our strength. We better figure out what the Lord wants. We better embrace our strength and give it to him so that his strength can do the work. Or we're going to collapse as a nation. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the intercession and the prayers of the body of Christ is what's going to keep this nation from collapsing. But I'm telling you, we're on a time frame that we better embrace him. <laughs> we need some real repentance from religion. We need some real repentance because of division. It's interesting that I had that, and then I got on, a, on, on the brother's call with, with, with apostles and prophets all over the country, and that's when the light bulb went off and goes, this really wasn't just about Eva. It was about Eva. This is about the intercessory movement in the body of Christ over our nation. And I started sharing that, and, and everybody had, everybody bought into it. Everybody said, man, this is God. But I'm telling you what, you want to see the miraculous? Quit doing it in your strength. You want to see his God hand move? Quit moving yours. And that was good. Faith does not come from who we are, but from who he is. Run with endurance the race that is set before you, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, Hebrews 12. Faith is a response, and so it can only respond to the level it has seen and heard. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Let me tell you something. Until you start seeing the miraculous in your vision form and your imagination, you won't even think that you're capable of it. And it's going to take some faith to push into it. You have no faith unless you know him. Our faith responds to increased revelation. So how do I get the life of God to flow in my life? How do I become a functioning branch into the vine? You know, I've lost some weight. Got a new shoulder. 
I think I'm going to pick up tennis. So I started, I downloaded three books from Kindle on how to play tennis. I read all the rules. I asked Susie if, this morning if she could dress me in a tennis outfit. She says, you don't own one. I looked for some little white shorts and don't have any. So I just found a racket. You know, when you don't really have it, you just run a racket. And that's most of Christianity right now. We just run a racket because we don't really know. So I've read all the books on tennis. I can tell you that how to keep score. I can do all these things. And I, I, I got some YouTube videos on how to swing. And man, with my new shoulder surgery, I, I can swing it. <clears throat> then I went out and played tennis. That's pretty ugly. I'm telling you, I don't have near the coordination that I read about. I'm not as agile as those videos taught me. All right? Susie even said this morning, when it's not as hot, we need to go play tennis. No, we're not. You, you, know how, you know how degrading my wife can be. She was nine months pregnant and played a game of basketball horse and beat me. Nine months, and, and all the neighbor was like, man, that's really bad. I'm like, there's certain things I'm gifted at, certain things I'm not. But here, here's the bottom line. I, I was reading uh, some of the YouTube things, and there's some, a lot of great tennis coaches out there. Most of the tennis, coach, tennis coaches – at some time have either been in the Olympics or played professional, and now they're their instructors. You know, and I, I, I read all the stuff about tennis. And I, you know, it's kind of like Christianity. I started reading all the books. I started reading the book about Christianity. I read about the miracle workers and the 40s and 50s and the miracles and tent revivals and all that. And, and I didn't, I, I couldn't pull it off. It'd be like me going to Wimbledon. That'd be a joke. It'd be an expensive trip and feel really foolish. But I got this email from, from one of the uh, coach, uh, one of the coaches. And, and he said, uh, $10,000, you could come to my camp. Now, listen, I talked about being the bookkeeper. Didn't even run that buyer. There's no way she's going to let me spend $10,000 to learn to play tennis because she's seen me in my tennis. That would be money not well spent. But what if? What if? This tennis coach at this camp, it was, a, it was a supernatural camp, comes up and said, hey, why don't you let me crawl inside of you, and then we'll play tennis. So that's what happened. The problem is I had to give up my abilities to respond to nothing so that his abilities would function. He had the muscle memory because he's a professional. He had all the cut the ball off knowing that it's going to be here. I'm like chasing it like a rabbit. <laughs> you ever see me play handball? That's funny. <laughs> it doesn't work. My cousin, my cousin was uncoordinated fat guy. But he was really, really, really good at racquetball. I played a couple times with him after I threw the thing at him and got mad, and I'm like, I'm quitting. And he goes, dude, you're just a dumb jock trying to chase the ball. And he goes, I'm lazy. I cut it off. I make one step and get where I need to be. You're over here sweating and running. He goes, I just, I just get in front of it. I'm like, that fat boy ain't even breaking a sweat. I'm out here dying. 
somewhere somebody had taught him to cut off some things. So I can have a professional tennis coach living inside of me. Just like you have a professional Christian living inside of you. Then how come you're not playing a good tennis game? Because you haven't embraced your weakness. And let him actually play for you. Is this making sense? What, what I have done, what I would do, is I would want to take over because once in a while, I want to hit it. Once in a while, I want to have a great serve. Once in a while, <laughs> dude, you're not going to win tournaments unless you completely surrender and let the professional in you do the work. Does that make sense? There's all the notes. But if I insist on trying to play, then the champion within me would have never happened. The two of us could not play at the same time. Standing on the court, freely admitting that I can't play, I chose to hand it over to him. I present my body to him as an instrument to play tennis. We present our bodies to him. We rest in him. When we choose to let him play the game of life in us and for us. It's one leap of faith that declares that he is our life and later a million choices of faith at every challenge is presented. You face an impossible situation that is a trigger to present yourself. A situation at home where you can't stand coming home, a sinful habit you can't seem to break, a sickness where there is no hope, a difficult person, a lack of provision, and from your heart you say, Jesus, I can't, but you can. And that is all I need to know. Let's go do it. So the Christian life is summed up as the consciousness that we live within us. We know it. We consider it. And we present ourselves to him and draw upon his infinite life in every situation we find ourselves in. This means that as we grow in Christ, and become mature, listen to this, we have an increased sense of our weakness. Just like that vision this week with Eva. She had to give up her right arm, which is her dominant strength arm, to embrace him so that her weak arm had all the strength it needed. It doesn't change for you either. A sense of our inability to play tennis on our own and learn to more and more to live from his strength. We let the coach play the game through us and not on our own. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope that this world seeing what God is truly like. I want you to stand up, and I just want to read this over you as a closing prayer. Did you get this today? I, I tried to make it as simple. Thank God I didn't find any white shorts. I could have worn my bike pants. But then y'all would be comparing me to Lance Armstrong. What was that, Susan? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that girl don't play, does she?
Okay, listen, listen, I think there's a couple keys today. First, you got to know. Then you got to consider. There's a lot of people at the considering portion get hung up and won't consider because they don't want to pay the price to be hidden in Christ. Their ego's too big. Their own, their own opinion is too big. Their own ability is too good. I say you have a bad accounting system if you can't consider who he is and give him complete control. Receive this. I do not cease to give thanks for you, Paul said, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in knowledge of him. That's knowing. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Here's your purpose. What are the riches of his glory? Glorious inheritance to the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the works of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. You want me to say that again? Far above. If the, is Jesus far above all of those things? Then so are you. Above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Father, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to hear the heart's cry of your people, to have an encounter that we know that we know that we know who you are, and to be able to consider the cost of surrender to who you are. And for you to become the head and us to become surrendered and less. And Father, as we've done the math on it, and we've made the choice to surrender, honor our ability to present and then manifest your kingdom through us individually and corporately. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages. Read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.